before we head into our award ceremony, I'd like to give a big thank you to the Sororian who put together tonight's doings, our dinner chair per chairperson, Wendy Slight. And to say thank you to two more Sororians who handled each and every detail of these awards, Mike Sorrell and Jack D Max Sorrell and Jack Deasy. And one more big thank you, this time to every news organization that submitted entries. The Sororians first handed out these awards 73 years ago in 1945. The first award on November 17th 1945 went to science writer Bill Lawrence of the Times, who was the sole eyewitness of the world's press of the dropping of the A-bomb on Nagasaki. Luckily, despite Kim Jong-un and our president, there was no need for A-bomb coverage last year. 2000 <laughs> 2017 was still a pretty interesting year journalistically, and despite fiscal and political pressure, your news organizations continued to hold the powerful to account. Our winners tonight show that. We have lots of laurels to dispense, 21 medallions and 15 merit awards. In addition, we have those two other honors, both named for storied New York journalists. To start things off, I'd like to introduce our first vice president, who next month will try to replace me, David Andelman. <laughs> D David was editor of World Power. No, no applause, please. <laughs> David was editor of World Policy Journal, and has more than 15 lines in Wikipedia. David. <laughs> You know, for two years, I have watched with great admiration as our distinguished president, Bernie Kirsch, dished out the medallions and merit awards to some of the best and brightest in our profession. And now, from the on-deck circle, which our sports writers, uh, sports winners will, will understand what that reference uh, is, it's my great pleasure to hand out the first half dozen awards tonight. So here's the drill. I'll read the medallions followed by the merit citations, and I'll invite each of you to come up and collect their swag. Now, um, you can all follow along, by the way, in the Silurian News, which you should be sitting on, or if you've had good sense, you'll actually take it out and can open it up. Um, I, I was the editor of it, so, you know, <laughs> you'll allow me a little bit of false modesty. Um, it start, starts on page four, and to get right down to it, our first award, which begins in breaking news. And that's truly my first great love as a hack, breaking news. Um, the medallion goes to the record staff for their remarkable dissection of the terrorist attack October 31 along a Manhattan bike path that killed eight people, excelling just where a local news organization should, diving deeply into the suspect himself from Patterson, New Jersey, in their backyard. The record also gathers a merit award for its coverage of a plane crash in Teterboro. So, the, um, the record, record, this goes to the record staff. Who from the record staff wants to jump up here and collect this? Uh, I will. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, that's there you wonderful. are. Thank that's you. wonderful. What is your name? I'm in force. Next up. We have feature news. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Well, the record also gets the merit award. Oh, you, you yes. can come back second time. There you go. <laughs> wow. You can keep coming back, I suppose. But um, <laughs> And that was for the coverage of a plane crash in Teterboro, New Jersey. Next up, feature news. A truly gripping story of a South Bronx heroin den. A dark trip through the labyrinths of addiction. Using the alchemy of vivid writing and meticulous reporting, Richard Shapiro of the New York Daily News produced a classic and timely example of the union. There he is. Richard, congratulations. You probably joined the paper after I left, but uh, there we are. I think that's probably right. <laughs> yeah. 
And uh, two merit awards here for features to Benjamin Weiser and Alan Foyer of the New York Times for a horrific bus crash three years later. Neither Alan nor Ben is here. They're probably out covering some other real news tonight. I, he nods, yes, indeed. So we have their editor collecting the award. Awesome. That's terrific. And a second one. This is a fun one. This goes to a Bloomberg News reporter for Bro, I'm Going Rogue. And his, ah! and his name is, is, woo, his name is Zeke Fox. It is spelled F-A-U-X, which as we who know a little bit of that language knows, means fake. <laughs> Faux. But this is not a fake news story. So, will Zeke, a.k.a. Fox, a.k.a. Faux, please come up. <laughs> I hope I didn't embarrass him too much. <laughs> Next we have investigative reporting. And for anyone who's ever paid a real estate tax bill, as my wife and I can attest, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> the next winner has to be our hometown hero. And in this category, um, that doesn't begin to capture the magnitude of the task our winner set out to accomplish. He scoured two and a half million tax bills. I have trouble deciphering my own. Okay, I suspect you may have had a little help from a computer maybe. Um, in a five-part series, Matt Clark of Newsday revealed how Nassau County's effort to reform its tax assessment system raised taxes of the poor, elderly, and minority homeowners by some $1.6 billion over seven years and cut taxes for homeowners who could afford appeals while enriching the county's tax appeals firms, all large contributors to County Executive Edward Mangano, who I suspect did not buy a table here tonight. <laughs> um, incidentally, to minimize foot traffic, Matt can also collect his award for reporting on minority issues for this same my, uh, monumental endeavor. So, there is he. There he is. He doesn't even really look like an accountant, does he? <laughs> the merit award for investigative reporting goes to Tommy Zambito of the Journal News for Metro North Loses Its Way. Tom. An old colleague of mine at the Daily News, by the way. Wait, wait, well, we got to get your picture. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Now, the award in the next category, the Medallion for Public Service, gets very personal for me. Since I spent my last full year at the New York Times as the transportation reporter, I guess a tribute to the axiom that what goes around comes around. So here we are again. The headline writer called the series System Failure, but that only captures a hint of the decades-long systematic mismanagement by the MTA of the city's subways, something I can point out back to Richard Ravitch's time in charge. In fact, I saw Richard at lunch today on the other side of the room. He is still kicking. <laughs> anyway. Here, the Times has effectively defined the category of public service. Brian M. Rosenthal, Emma G. Fitzsimmons, Michael LaForgia, and the Times staff sharing in this heroic undertaking that spanned much of last year in print and especially online, which was quite remarkable. So, who's here? Are all four of them? They're all here. Two of them are here. Okay. Hi, congratulations. He gets the box. Oh, he gets the box, <laughs> of course. Coming closer. There you go. Bravo. <laughs> now, since I'm in the on deck circle, 
I get to re award sports reporting and commentary, which is our next category. And we're back to the record and sports columns of Tara Sullivan, who has explored, as the judges noted, a remarkable depth of insight, reporting, and quite simply, humanity. Even venturing into the stands with family and friends of my own hometown New England Patriots. There I've outed myself, and so much more. So, <laughs> Tara. Where's Tara? Tara's not there. Uh, Tara's, Tara's probably out in the stands for the pub. Maybe, maybe she's reporting on the Red Sox. <laughs> That's exactly what she's doing. Oh, my God. <laughs> and a merit award, which goes to Jim Baumbach of Newsday for sports safety, looking at concussions and other injuries in high school football. Bravo. And after this, you get our current president, Bernie, and we'll swap places. Um, we have two medallions to present in business and financial reporting. The first to a pair of intrepid Bloomberg News journalists who unmasked the Kushner real estate empire, digging deep into the real estate firm controlled by who else? The president's son-in-law. Does anybody know that name? Jared. <laughs> Caleb Melby, Melby and David, excuse me, Kachinevsky. No, no, wait, wait, listen. I spent two years covering, three years covering Eastern Europe for the Times. I ought to be able to get this one. Kachinevsky. Whoa. They share the honors for unmasking Jared's worst deal. <laughs> Did I get it right? Nailed it. Uh. <laughs> now the second medallion clearly anticipated the writer's good fortune tonight with his look behind the curtain of the Elliott Management hedge fund of Republican megadonor Paul Singer called Whatever It Takes to Win. Fortune's Jan Wiesner has done just that. He's won. Jan. John, John, oh, you told me that too. Yes, oh my God, and I got it wrong. <laughs> John. And he's going to be our next president. Who, oh, John? <laughs> yeah, John. John, of course, John. Jen, yeah, like Jennifer. Oh, Jen. Jen. Yeah, oh, Jen. Jen. Oh, my God. Yeah. I got it wrong the twice. The thing that people struggle with. It's not Thank Jen. Thank you so Jen. much. Jen. Thank you. <laughs> wait, wait, you got to get a Thank picture. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes to win, she did. So, um, the Merit Award goes to Silurian Susan Antilla for the advice trap undertaken by The Intercept in partnership with the Investigative Fund. Susan is not here today. Susan is out investigating someone else tonight, apparently. Okay, now we turn it over to this distinguished gentleman, Thank my you. predecessor. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now it's time for another David. I worked at the Times for 23 years, and I got to know the byline, David W. Dun Dunlap, but not the man. But two people who did, and were also past recipients of our Peter Keese Award, are Clyde Haberman and Joe Berger. So Clyde wrote a lovely piece on David in this month's Silvia News, and that means that Joe gets to do the honors of introducing David this evening. Joe. Thanks a lot, Bernie. First of all, I just want to say, I'd like to hear a round of applause for Bernie for running this organization for two years. And, and in, in his soft-spoken but with tart humor way, uh, he's really brought this this uh, group together in a, in a very nice and he healthy way, and I'd like to, you know. Okay. Now, David Dunlap has long been one of those <clears throat> treasured journalistic assets that newspapers prize. 
in his case, an eloquent expert on the architecture, infrastructure, and history of New York. He knows every significant block and building in the city and how each came to be. He's photographed most of them and written about many for his long-running and often luminous column, Building Blocks. The construction of the New World Trade Center on the remains of the old one was a subspecialty of his, and his reportage there was often breathtaking. But more than knowing, he can write liltingly and lyr lyrically about those he has deep affection for, and even those he doesn't. The affection is palpable. Take a story he wrote about the New York area's new bridges. Some of you know that I've spent a few uh, of my diminishing years describing the building of the Tappan Zee Bridge. As Vic Siegel once famously replied to a tourist who asked, Sprechen Sie Deutsch? No, he said, Tappan Zee Bridge. <laughs> in any case, David at one point wrote about the fact that there were three new bridges rising in New York. And I was dazzled and more than a little envious of the way he opened his story. Let me read you. New York, the city of perpetual arrival, is getting three new gateways. Diaphanous cable state bridges that look almost too ethereal to bear the load of thousands of vehicles and people each day. They are already transforming the skyline with luck. He may, they may even improve the drive. In the last half century, while New York was out of the bridge building business, cable state bridges were proliferating around the world. They were relatively easy and economical to build and they almost couldn't help but look beautiful with their slender pylons and radiating cables. It's as though a race of giant harp makers had been roaming the planet, threading it together with a gossamer strands of steel. Lovely. David's building blocks column crowned a career that stretches back to 1975 when fresh out of Yale, he was one of James Reston's famed clerks. During the 1990s, he was among the first reporters to focus exclusively on issues essential to the gay and lesbian community, and he brought those is issues, features, and profiles into the mainstream of news. As importantly, David has long served as a mentor and model to dozens of reporters particularly a growing cadre of reporters who not that long ago, yes, in Peter Keyes's day, would have had to conceal their private lives within the times, but have gone on to distinguished careers covering the full smorgasbord of world, national, local, and cultural news. A courtly, soft-spoken, but iron-willed man, David showed them how to be great journalists, yet remain themselves, and dozens of his colleagues are grateful. David, in semi-retirement, now runs what effectively is the Times Museum. And you, you, when I brought some kids up from my class, you showed them very graciously, out of the spur of the moment, all those artifacts like um, lead type, typewriters. <laughs> I was telling Clyde, we, you know, we just moved and I found six typewriters in my closet. How did I end up with six typewriters? A war correspondent, you, you need some? You got it. A war correspondent's helmet and yellowed newspaper headlines. It was something he started as a pastime while he was turning out great journalism. David has already won a number of prizes, including the Citation of Excellence from the American Institute of Architects, a specialty cherished award since he is the son of a beloved architect who died too early. Now because of his stellar career and his record as a mentor, the Silurian Board has awarded him the 2018 Peter Keyes Award named after a reporter famous for his love and accumulation of, de of, of details and his gift for helping younger colleagues find a way to make their own marks. That perfectly suits David. So let's give David a hand. Just before we hear from David, I'd like to present him with this plaque. In recognition of your distinguished work as a meticulous reporter, as a brilliant chronicler of New York, and as a sharer of your knowledge with younger journalists in the legendary tradition of Peter Case. David.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernie. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Clyde. Thanks to the judges. Thanks to all the Silurians, and thank you all um, very, very much. And congratulations to my colleagues who have been honored tonight, not only from the Times, though you are the dearest to me, uh, but from Bloomberg and City Limits, the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, the Daily News, Fortune, the Intercept and the Investigative Fund, the Journal News, NBCNewYork.com and WNBC, News 12 New York, New, or News 12 New Jersey, News, uh, Newsday, NorthJersey.com, The Record and Vanity Fair. More than ever, we really are all in it together. And this has been a this has been a wonderful week for my family. Uh, five days ago, my husband Scott Bain graduated from CUNY Law at the age of 51. So, so mom, wherever you are, I hope you're finally happy. I married a lawyer. Uh, tonight is my first Silurians dinner. Uh, I've never had the opportunity to uh, hear an acceptance speech for the Peter Keys Award, but I suppose that recipients customarily protest that they aren't worthy of the distinction. I so declare, with the authority imparted from having worked across the aisle from Peter during my years on GA and night rewrite. At once imposing and moth-eaten, Peter was about the gentlest, savviest, and most generous co-worker you'd ever want to know if you weren't a copy editor. <laughs> if you were a copy editor, well, God help you. And I should say that I checked out the moth-eaten line with Eric uh, before the dinner began, and he said, that's perfect. <laughs> What I love about the award is that it commemorates a journeyman. Star writers may drive traffic to our site, just as they made papers fly off the newsstand, but journey people have long propelled the times, day in and out, at a cruising speed that even Ben Bradley admired and envied. Today, I think of myself proudly as having been a journeyman. Believe me, though, it was not my ambition in 1975 to retire as a utility player. I imagined myself somewhere on the masthead, if not at the top of it. I was so full of shit at the age of 23. <laughs> I even have evidence in the form of carbon copies of my correspondence, which I preserved against the certain prospect of a request one day from the Library of Congress for the complete Dunlap papers. <laughs> yeah, I'm, st I'm still waiting. <laughs> Here's what I wrote before arriving at the Washington Bureau to serve as a clerk to Scotty Reston. I am planning to travel in the deeply carpeted corridors of power, the world of somber gray suits leaning over polished oaken tables. I can taste the desire to influence the newspaper that influences the world, and by God, I might yet get my turn. Yeah, I told you I was full of shit. <laughs> There was a problem, however, as I acknowledged to another friend in early 1976. What is a queer doing being personally introduced to the President of the United States? I asked in despair. What is a faggot doing getting telephone calls from Senator Kennedy, at home no less? Where does a fairy get off standing two feet away from Secretary Kissinger, taking messages from Vice President Rockefeller, having breakfast with a Saudi Arabian prince, and extending an invitation to a Times Law Convocation personally to Mr. Justice Powell? And how is it that a homosexual can not only be a friend, but a confidant of James Reston? I survived by divorcing my personal and professional lives completely, terrified that the revelation of one would bring the destruction of the other. My bigger problem, though, and not yet diagnosed, was alcoholism. That call from Kennedy came one night after I'd enjoyed a festive half-dozen postprandial libations all by myself. 
The senator wanted to get an urgent message through to Reston about newly passed legislation affecting Martha's Vineyard, where Scotty and his wife Sally owned the local newspaper. I promised I would convey the word promptly. But first, I called friends all around the country to brag that I'd just been on the phone with Teddy. Then I passed out, having forgotten my assignment entirely. To this day, I don't recall how I got out of that mess. Of course, maybe Kennedy forgot too. It was late, after all. <laughs> Despite these and other gaffes, I was appointed graphics editor in 1976, skipping right over the reporter's ranks and into the top tier of Group O. Me, an editor on the Times at age 24. Visions of the masthead danced again in my head. I opened an account at the Morgan Guarantee Trust that was about $99,000 below their customary minimum threshold. <laughs> I found a duplex apartment on Central Park West, not far from where Abe Rosenthal lived. I wore Brooks Brothers suits every day, and I gave out my home phone number as Circle 69466 until a corporate headhunter head spotted it on my resume and told me never ever to do that again. Heady as an internship was, as an editorship was, I realized eventually that I had to spend time as a reporter if I were to be taken seriously down the road as a masthead candidate. After four years in Group O, and much against my own pretentious self-image, I set out reluctantly to obtain a strategic demotion solely for the sake of ultimate advancement. Scotty had once counseled me, it takes 18 months to have a baby at the Times. Sure enough, my lobbying stretched over a year and a half before Abe transferred me to the Metro desk. What a revelation. Reporting was so exciting. Sometimes it was a lot of fun. Sometimes it was almost too thrilling. I remember racing toward the Plaza Hotel one day after the police reports of a bomb threat there and asking myself, what sane person uh, equipped with the information I have now would race toward the plaza, uh, but then I kept on racing. Yet I hadn't entirely surrendered the notion of climbing the ladder. By the mid-1980s, thanks to Arthur Salzberger Jr. and Max Frankel, it began to appear that gay people had a future in the pages and on the staff of the New York Times. And thanks to the gentle intervention of Nan Robertson, I had stopped drinking. It seemed as if I might have one last distant shot at the masthead when the national editor, Dave Jones, asked if I wanted to be considered for a correspondence posting, the next box that any ambitious staff member had to check. There was just one thing, Dave said. He'd heard I was newly sober. He understood that recovery depended on a community of fellow alcoholics. He didn't want me to jeopardize my sobriety by a life untethered from that support system, a life led largely on the road, in the isolation of numberless hotels with cocktail lounges downstairs and mini bars upstairs. He said I could decline his offer without prejudice. A day later, I gratefully did just that. I would never again get such an offer. But I didn't seek one out either. Instead, I assumed the role of Metro stalwart, a role made so much more rewarding by the presence in my life of colleagues like Susan Heller Anderson, Dan Barry, Bill Borders, Glenn Collins, Fred Conrad, Jim Dwyer, David Gonzalez, Rich Meislin, and Emily Rube, and Joe Vecchione, and of editors like Shelley Bin, Ann Cronin, Susan Edgerly, John Landman, Mike Leahy, Joyce Pernick, Joe Sexton, Al Siegel, and Mike Stern. Anne taught me a vital lesson one afternoon when she upbraided me privately for having barked at her a few days earlier in the middle of the newsroom. Not that her feelings were hurt. Rather, she said, younger staff members who emulated my behavior might infer that it was perfectly okay for a reporter to berate an editor publicly. I was abashed and chastened, of course, but also secretly, gr secretly gratified to think that I'd become an exemplar even without a private office or a Pulitzer Prize. Journalism, as we all know in this room, isn't a profession, really. It's more of a calling, like fishing. Not much book learning is needed, but you do have to have spent enough time out on the water to be able to discern those pewter shadows among the wave crests that betray the presence of a bountiful school below. You do have to have escaped enough stupid mistakes at sea to avoid making the one that could kill you. 
And then you do have to pass on what you've learned so that another generation can fish. More than a year ago, I began meeting every other Thursday with Zach Wichter, a young news assistant on the business desk, for a 45-minute lunch and debriefing. He assures me I've been a mentor, but he's too kind. Zach has plenty enough on the ball, with page one national and foreign reporting assignments already to his credit. All I've done is help him untie a couple of knots and thread through a few moments of uncertainty. Happily, none of Zach's anxiety turns on being gay. That's another astonishing change I've witnessed since 1975. For staff members of his generation, sexual identity is pretty much a non-issue at the times. Recently, however, Zach learned that a full-time reporting gig would probably elude him in the near future. He responded with chipper resolve, acknowledging that what seemed like a disappointment would in fact offer him a valuable chance to gain more experience. After all, he said to me, it takes 18 months to have a baby at the times. And that's when I knew my job was done. I had vouchsafed a bit of Scotty and a bit of myself to a distant future when old Zachary can pass those words onto his young protege. And I'm betting that it will still take 18 months to have a baby at the New York Times. Thank you very much. David, beautiful David. I found this lead from a few years back on the former website called The All, A-W-L. Colony 1209 is a luxury apartment complex located at 1209 DeKalb Avenue in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Located one block from a public library and a smattering of 99 cent shops. The five-story property's geometric, shiny blue and gray facade which makes it look like a fortress built by a first grader in Minecraft, sticks out in a largely residential neighborhood packed with brick and vinyl-sided two- and three-family buildings. Through the windows, you can peer into the, you can peer into the ultra-modern lobby, which is furnished with items like a plastic bubble chair hanging from the ceiling. It seems like a colony on the moon, but the idea behind it is less Space Jam than Manifest Destiny. That was the lead graph of one of the many insightful, well-written articles by our Dennis Duggan winner, Samantha Maldonado of the CUNY Grad School of Journalism. And if there is any editor out there ready to hire her, too late, she'll be interning at CNN this summer. So, so many of our former Dennis Duggan winners have gone on to successful journalism careers, and so we applaud the CUNY Grad School for its dedication. A few examples of success stories. Last year's winner, Will Mathis, is doing an internship at Bloomberg. Our 2016 winner, Megan Cerullo, is a reporter and writer at the Daily News. And jumping back a few years to 2010, Simone Sebastian is deputy editor of the Washington Post's America Desk. Like other past winners, Samantha was selected for the Dennis Duggan Award because of how she excelled at producing stories about everyday New Yorkers, even though she came to the J School last year after working in communications for the Free Library of Philadelphia. But she, she quickly got to work on a Manhattan Beat and the clips began piling up. One of her professors at CUNY, Ellen Tomposki, a former Daily News reporter and editor called Sam a strong writer and a natural reporter. She has shown a sharp eye for stories that, might, that others might overlook. She wrote a story for City Limits about people who pluck treasures from dumpsters and an article on the woman behind the New York facts that Blair from the city's Wi-Fi kiosk made next city. She turned out a feature for religion news on the man who gives tours at the catacombs under old St. Patrick's in Little Italy. 
and she regularly contributes to many other publications. Samantha, now 27, is from Springfield, Mass., and is a graduate of Wesleyan University. She is among eight CUNY J schoolers, recently chosen for the Media Leadership Project, a new mentoring program that pairs students with a hand-picked group of executives from CNN and NBC News, MSNBC. She's set to graduate in December. What's next for Samantha? Who knows, maybe she'll tell us. Thank you so much. First, I'd like to present Samantha with this plaque in recognition of your insightful reporting chronicling New York City and its people in the spirit of Dennis Duggan. And in, addi and in, ad in, and in addition, an early graduation present. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really great to get this. Uh, thank you to the society and to um, my professors and classmates, some of whom are here tonight, and I'm really grateful that they're here and grateful for all the thoughtful feedback, um, harsh uh, feedback sometimes that they've given me, but it's really helped me grow. Um, and that's something I'm really thankful for. Um, what I'm not thankful is uh, to do this. <laughs> this is something I dreaded. Um, I hate being in front of people. <laughs> I did not want to make this speech. Um, I'd much rather be the one sitting back and asking the questions and listening to what people have to say. Um, and that is why I've decided to become a reporter. Um, I'm nosy, I want to know everything, and journalism is a way to be professionally nosy. Uh, in case someone finds that unsavory, I can always give the excuse that it's my job. Um, and even before I knew I wanted to be a reporter or knew that I could be, um, I found myself reporting. Um, and one of the clearest memories I have of that is uh, during my study abroad trip um, in college, which was in 2011. Um, I was dropped off in a neighborhood in uh, Cape Town that had never been before, and we were given a day to figure out uh, sort of what was going on in the neighborhood, who was living there, how it was changing. Um, and I didn't know what to do, I was lost, I didn't have a phone or a map, but I did have a notebook. Um, and so we walked around, talked to people, knocked on doors, went into businesses, racked up a list of contacts, and at the end of the day we had a sit-down meeting with um, a, a very large Israeli developer uh, who was investing in the neighborhood and basically was single-handedly responsible for the crazy development and change. Um, and because of that, I was able to paint a pretty full picture of the neighborhood uh, and tell my other classmates when we got back for the day. Um, and walking around cities and noticing things is still sort of how I get most of my story ideas. Um, a lot of them were talked about. <laughs> um, and that's basically just me uh, noticing and asking questions, um, whether it's the story for the all um, back in 2013, I believe, uh, about the space age <laughs> uh, development in Bushwick, um, or how I wondered why motorists and public transit riders got commuter benefits when I was at the library, but not bicyclists. Uh, so I dug into that and found out that there is in fact a way to get uh, commuting benefits when you're a bicyclist. Um, and again, the uh, people who go through the trash in Soho, um, I just was walking around the neighborhood looking for a story that had to do with nighttime based on an assignment from Ellen, who's here. Um, and I saw somebody who was digging through the trash but was wearing the new pair of Apple uh, ear, ear pods. Um, so I came up to talk to him. Um, and like Dennis Duggan, I wanted to accurately and empathi empathetically document the lives of ordinary people. Um, sometimes the strongest depictions of public life, I think, are stories about folks who aren't always in the public eye, whether by choice or by chance. And these are the stories I want to tell. And so looking ahead, I want to keep hitting the streets, uh, hopefully with a microphone in hand, so I can produce radio stories. Um, and I also want to dig more into investigative projects. Um, and I know I have a lot further to go, and I'm excited about what the future holds. Uh, I head to CNN this summer, and whatever comes next, um, it will be with a great support system behind me at the J School. And I'll forge ahead inspired by Dennis Duggan and the honor you've given me tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Samantha. We now have a bunch of other awards to give out, and leading the ceremonies will be our awards co-chair people, Mike Sorrell and Jack Deasy. 
Hello, everyone. Our, uh, our next award is for science and health reporting. Uh, and the medallion goes uh, to City Limits for a story, or four part series of stories uh, called Death Disparities, uh, which were about health inequality in New York City. Um, interlocking factors that underlie the growing disparity in health and life expectancy between poor and wealthier neighborhoods of the city. And the winners are Ruth Ford, Janaki Chada, and Jarrett Murphy. I assume some of them are here. Two out of three? Two out of three. Sorry, Jared yeah. couldn't make it. He was coaching a baseball game. Uh, coaching a baseball game. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll take your picture. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. A second medallion for science and health reporting uh, goes to the record uh, and to Linda Washburn for a series of stories, one of which was called Miracle on Ice. Um, she is a sure-handed reporter uh, covering cutting-edge clinical advances and reporting on medicine's enduring mysteries. Uh, her finely wrought stories feature gripping human drama that holds the reader wrapped. Hello. Uh, environmental reporting. Uh, this one is all about electricity. At the supply in New York City and Westchester with electricity for decades, the Indian Point nuclear plant is set to shut down for good in 2012. So what happens then? In a series of well-researched, sharply written pieces, Thomas Sambito of the Journal News laid out for us the likely environmental, economic, and political impact of the closure. For his work, Zambito wins the medallion for environmental reporting. Tom. <laughs> That's the second one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good luck. And a merit award goes to Emily Dooley of Newsday for her series of stories exposing the Grumman Northrop Corporation as the likely source of groundwater contamination on Long Island. Emily? The next category is arts and culture reporting. And um, uh, I don't think uh, many of us will be surprised to uh, learn that both uh, the medallion and the merit award were won by the New York Times. The medallion to uh, Michael Cooper for his story on the James Levine sexual abuse allegations uh, in which uh, he um, wrote th on three consecutive days about misconduct charges against the esteemed Metropolitan Opera conductor. Uh, Michael, are you here? Yes, that is me. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, guys. Okay. And the merit award goes to Michael Paulson of the Times for Race, Money, and Broadway, How the Great Comet Burned Out in which he tells the story of how messy and complicated Broadway has become by following one big musical production from beginning to end. Uh, Michael, are you here? Yes. Okay. Am I supposed to do something with this? Yeah. Commentary and editorials. Um, in a twice monthly column entitled, I was misinformed. And she did, uh, she named the column after that great line in uh, Casablanca. 
I won't go on to explain it because anybody, you know, below 40 is, you know, may not remember the movie at all. Um, in any event, uh, uh, Joyce um, Wadler uh, wrote the column, I was misinformed, uh, twice monthly. And uh, the New York Times, um, Sunday New York Times Metropolitan section. Joyce takes a whimsical, offbeat, personal, and often hilarious look at the way we live now. And the way she lives now in New York City. Joyce, where are you? And congratulations. Oh, here we are. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's going to be open. Okay. Cool. Yeah, in the same category, um, and this is a, this is a, yeah, it's a merit for Mike uh, Kelly of the record who is uh, kind of the Jack Kerouac of uh, recent journalism. Uh, he wins for his on-the-road columns across America covering Donald Trump's um, on his way to the party's nomination for the presidency. We know what happened after that. So Mike Kelly, are you here? <laughs> Jack Kerouac. I'll, I'll pick it up for him. Thank okay. you very much. Okay, he's working. He is. He's <laughs> the next category is people profiles. And uh, in, there are three awards here, a medallion and uh, two merits. Uh, two of the awards go to Vanity Fair, uh, which won't surprise you either. Uh, the medallion goes to Marie Brenner um, for a... Uh, a look into the dubious ethics of the late Roy Cohn uh, and his relationship to our current president. Uh, the uh, Merit Award to Vanity Fair goes to Evgenia Peretz for Lady and the Scamp, which is a profile of Nan Talese, one of the most successful book publishers in America, um, and the wife of new journalism legend Gay Talese. Uh, they've been married since 1959 and are one of the most glamorous and celebrated literary, literary couples in the United States. And uh, Evgenia described that phenomenon. Is she here? Woo! Yes. Call the Evgenia. Evgenia. Okay. okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Second merit award in the people profile category goes to Christopher Mogg of the record uh, for Garden State of Mind. Um, for the past year or so, Mogg has been producing a column uh, for the record to find and write about people who make the suburbs interesting. A serious challenge, but, <laughs> but, but he accomplished it. Uh, Christopher? Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, reporting on, on minority issues, uh, the medallion winner in this uh, category is Matt Clark, uh, who already received uh, his award earlier in the program. But we have two uh, merit awards, one to Thomas Friedman and Ann Choi for their two-part multimedia presentation of Unequal Justice, a, calibration, a collaboration between Newsday and News 12 Long Island that took a close look at race and ethnicity uh, in the Long Island criminal justice system. Thomas, and Hey, how are you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Here we go. Thank you. And the other merit goes to uh, Monsi Alvarado 
and Hannon Ardley for their series on local immigration issues. Are they here? From the record, of course. <laughs> Hi. 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 Good to see you again. Yeah. yeah. You spelled your name properly. Yes, this time. you did. <laughs> Uh, the next award is for Breaking News Photography, uh, which goes to Newsday uh, and Alejandra Villa um, for a photo uh, of the um, funeral of a victim of, of the notorious MS-13, the, the scourge of Long Island. Um, Alejandra, I understand, is not here. But uh, in feature photography, uh, the medallion goes to J. Conrad Williams of Newsday for his portfolio. <laughs> I'll finish it now. All right. You can read it with me, actually. <laughs> for his, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, for his uh, portrait of ph photographs illustrating how a group of men and women on Long Island deal with Parkinson's disease. Uh, they do it by uh, uh, joining a, a, uh, a health club, and the program is called uh, Rock Steady, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the striking images captures the grit and determination by these patients fighting a degenerative disease. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you very much. Hold up. Hold up. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> the Merit Award goes to uh, Kevin Wexler of the record for his photo essay on an uh, imam who is chaplain at the Bergen County Jail. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> hey, Kevin. That's great. <laughs> Photo up. Photographers. Sports photography is next, and the award goes to Newsday, Thomas A. Ferrara, for Altuve, the MVP. <laughs> and an overhead shot of, um, of the Houston Astros player sliding into home and being very happy to do it. <laughs> Thank you guys. We're near the end. Uh, television feature reporting. Uh, John Bathke of News 12 New Jersey wins the medallion for television feature reporting for his compelling and moving portrait of the transformation of Robert Sundholm, a down on his luck former janitor who in his retirement has become a celebrated artist. Are you here, John? <laughs> hey. I love the glasses. <laughs> I love them. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Uh, for Television Public Service and Investigative Reporting. Uh, the award goes to Walt Kane of um, News 12 New Jersey. Uh, Walt has won more than once, at least twice, maybe three times. Um, and uh, this is for his year-long investigation in the New Jersey Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, in which he exposed such gross conflicts of interest, corruption, and mismanagement um, that it prompted the state legislature to abolish the agency. Uh, Walt, come receive your award. Yeah, Walt, good to meet you. Congratulations. Oh, come in the middle. All these winners are very tall. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> the final awards. Um, best multimedia reporting and presentation. Two medallions uh, awarded in this category. One goes to the collaboration between NBCNewYork.com and WNBC. Um, they produced a week-long series, Lime Wars, which gave uh, viewers a comprehensive look at the perils of tick-bearing Lyme disease. Um, the series provided uh, the public with real guidance on how to prepare for a growing uh, public health threat. Uh, is anybody here from NBC? Bill Deal, where are they? <laughs> I know, but... Uh, and the, uh, the other medallion goes to reporter James O'Neill and visual journalist Chris uh, Pedota uh, of NorthJersey.com. Their nine chapter feature on the Morris Canal really rolled back time to give readers and viewers a multimedia education about how a now long forgotten canal stretching across 102 miles was the foundation of the early economy of New Jersey. Anybody here? Oh, you're here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Morris Canal, huh? Yes, I can hear you. Judges, Linda Amster, David Andelman, Joseph Berger, Suzanne Chal, Bill Deal, Gerald uh, Eskenazi, Alan Dodds Frank, Tony Guida, Clyde Haberman, Herb Haddad, Myron Candell, Valerie Kamor, Carol Lawson, Tony Mancini, Ben Petrusky, Ann Rofi, Wendy Slight, Michael Serrell, and Mort Scheinman. Give them all a good hand. They worked hard. And the final merit award tonight um, goes to uh, Newsday, which has won, won a lot of good uh, prizes tonight. Uh, it's about uh, a day in the life of Long Island. Uh, really an amazing uh, effort to enlist 70 uh, staffers and dozens of volunteer news uh, collectors in a vast multimedia look at June 21st the longest day of the year on Long Island. Stories for, and everywhere else. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. Not just I need an editor. I need an editor. That's why you need an editor. <laughs> what, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> uh, and uh, they, <laughs> they, uh, they used, <laughs> they used all these people in a hundred locations, uh, uh, all over <laughs> Long Island on the longest day of the year. So, uh, Newsday, where are you? <laughs> hey, sure. we'll take a picture. The final photo. The final photo of the night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Th thank everyone for being here tonight. If you haven't finished everything in your glass, you cannot leave. But once you do that, we hope to see you again here next year. Thank you. <laughs>